Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Reptile Dysfunction. I'm Jameson Gahagan from Gahagan Laboratories, here to show off one of my favorite species today, the Ligodactylus Williams eye, also known as the Electric Blue Day Gecko. Uh, these guys come from Tanzania, Africa. They only actually occur in about a 8 square kilometer range within the country. They occur within pine forests. Between 2004 and 2009, these guys' population was reduced by about 24% due to the timber industry and illegal pet trade. Since then, they've been listed as a CITES Class 3, which means no more wild exports. Uh, in parts of uh, most of Western Europe, you can't actually own them without having uh, captive paperwork proving that it was bred in captivity here in the country. They've gotten a lot harder to get, but uh, you don't need any paperwork, um, which is kind of an unfortunate thing. Um, Why is that an unfortunate thing? It just yeah. proof that it's not. There's so much smuggling going on with all sorts of other animals. Um, I, I just think that having proof, you know, if you have nothing to hide, why not? So these guys being in the Ligodactylus day geckos, they are a smaller dwarf gecko. Um, so a 12, 12, 18 is perfect size for them. People do go bigger. A lot of people keep these guys uh, cohabitated with dart frogs. I personally don't. I don't think that both animals' needs will be fully met. I think that a lot of people have a lot of success doing cohab tanks with these with dart frogs, pomillos, and uh, Lagodactylus williams eye. Uh, for the frogs to be healthy, you're going to have to have it cool, which is going to mess with the geckos. Um, you're going to also have to have it really humid for the frogs, which is going to mess with the geckos. These guys actually take it fairly arid uh, with, I spray them four times a day with a mist king system. Uh, they eat a fruit-based diet along with uh, insect supplementary. Um, I offer them the, I have some right here actually. Zoomed uh, day gecko food. They actually have since discontinued this product, but um, there's another European product that I'm actually trying to import in, uh, Croc Doc, I'm pretty sure it's called, but very similar, uh, dry food, so you can leave them in here for days. Um, you'll see when you know they get wet or something, you can replace them, but it's a better option than having to replace wet Pangea that'll rot, mold, within uh, 48 hours. Uh, this stuff will stay powder fresh for about a week. Big issue with these guys that people have with breeding them is the fact that they adhesively lay their eggs. Um, I have eggs throughout all of these cages. Um, these are all breeding pairs up here, um, and I'm filling in all the bottom ones as well. The eggs, they the female will actually place them throughout the cage where she finds it to be that like Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot, not too cool, and humidity is all right. But the problem with this being is they'll usually place their eggs up so high that they are um, sex determined by temperature. Uh, most 90 plus percent of what's produced in the United States is all male. And it just has to do with the types of lighting, you know, the way we set up our cages, it, and also the fact that they just love laying it. If they're given a warm area, they will populate males. Um, a little solution I've found actually in recent years is using these. These are flower shop tubes. Um, they love using a nice little tight area to get into to lay their eggs and they'll actually lay in the bottoms of them and then you can pull them out and incubate them um, at a lower temperature outside of the cage. So we just sprinkle those throughout their cage and you'll actually see the females sitting within them a lot. Uh, nesting behavior, stuff like that. Uh, these guys though, I feed them uh, eighth inch crickets. A lot of people go bigger. Um, you can go up to quarter inch, but I just like the smaller food option. Because um, if you leave, if, if a cricket or two gets loose in one of these planted cages, you'll find it later on and it'll be full sized and totally unedible to the get go. And even pose a risk of getting bitten up by the cricket. I, I've seen it happen with smaller geckos and it's not very fun to deal with. Uh, I feed these guys fruit flies, Heidi I am Melangaster, bean beetles, eighth inch crickets. I have done um, small discoid roaches, like nymphs from them, 
But again, one doesn't get eaten, you'll find a two inch long roach in your cage about a year later that you could have swore you thought got eaten. Um, and then along with the fruit diet, three times of misting a day, they thrive. Um, I, for lighting, I use the double domes. This is a big thing with these guys. I've tried a, other types of lighting, uh, puck lights with some success with a UV bar. Um, there's even arguments that day geckos don't necessarily need UVB. I think that that's, I don't agree with it because they're a diurnal gecko species. They're going to be in the ultraviolet light. Um, why not provide them with it in captivity? And the uh, 50 watt bulb uh, basketball by Zoomed provides a like about a 90 to 91 degree hot spot in just one little area at the top so they can have a th uh, temperature gradient outwards. Uh, it'll get into the 80s and high 70s on the farthest side away from the light. And then I use a compact fluorescent 5.0 bulb on the other side. You'll want to change the UVB compact fluorescent bulb, any UVB bulb for that matter, once a year. Um, just because once they're tested um, from purchase till a year after use, their uh, wavelengths are going to be completely different. They're not going to produce nearly any uh, UVB anymore after a year of use. But with all those variables, I um, have had a lot of luck with these guys. Produce probably about 50 babies a year. Um, it's important to breed these guys in captivity, I believe, because Unfortunately, they are below a minimum viable population in the wild. Um, when they reach class three, it means that there's approximately 5,000 individuals or less in the wild, and that's usually the end for most species. We see in cheetahs and stuff today, where there was a bottleneck in their population, and now uh, there's almost 98% um, uh, similar genes within the cheetah population. You, you just end up having it so that everything's so monogenized genetically that one ailment will wipe everything out. There's uh, tons of species like the Madagascar tomato frog, um, Mexican axolotl that are all but extinct in the wild. There's healthy, healthy populations um, in captivity. So unfortunately, even though we'll never see it in the wild again, the zoo programs and the private hobbyist conservationists will maintain you know in future generations I found with incubation with this species once the female lays two eggs uh, incubation can be anywhere from 50 to 90 days um, I incubate anywhere between 75 to 81 degrees and um, when faced with night and daytime uh, temperature fluctuations um, and which you face when they're left in the cage adhered to the wall, um, they will go longer towards 90 days. Um, and usually if they're on the warmer side, they will end up hatching male. Um, temp sexing usually favors male at warmer temperatures in, in most squamata. When these guys hatch as hatchlings, I'll put them into a large fly cup um, with fly cultures we, we put our fly cultures into. I think it's a, a 16 ounce, pretty much like a soup deli uh, cup and I put a little bit of sphagnum or wet paper towels in the bottom and I'll actually put it right in the cage so it can get a little bit of the beneficial UVB. We let them grow for a couple days in there with high humidity and then they're put into our little hatchery where um, they're in smaller cage units that are set up arboreal, uh, very small oak branches for them to be able to navigate around and uh, we use a high output T, uh, T5 UVB bulb with them and puck lights that are small. We actually get ours from Home Depot and set them up on a dimmer. Um, we can get very small hot spots with them and I found this very beneficial for raising young. These guys are very well known for their bright blue color but it's actually only the male that will have the bright orange belly with the electric blue back. Uh, the females will range anywhere from a light, almost like a mint green, to a lightish blue, to even like a copper or a brown. The females will have a lot of variability to them, and also probably one of the largest mistakes with these geckos is when more than one male uh, is together in an enclosure, they will form a little hierarchy and blue is the dominant color. It's like peacocking. They, you know, it's just the prettiest male will be bright blue 
and the rest will try to mimic females by being uh, light green or even brown. So a lot of the times people think they have a pair together until they start squabbling or one male tries to overthrow the dominant male and he starts blowing up. So with uh, I've always just been a huge advocate of getting a jeweler's loop. You can get them off of Amazon super cheap and you look at their femoral pores. Males will have black pores along their legs in a V. Females will not. They'll have the pores, but you will not see little black dots. The uh, femoral pores act as scent glands and they push out a little waxy secretion and as they climb on stuff, they release it. So they'll leave little scent trails essentially and that's how they'll set up territory and attract mates in the wild. With these guys, you can actually go minimalistic. I used to uh, keep these guys with just a fake plant for laying eggs. Um, 12 by 12 by 18 zoom ed enclosure, lighting with just some oak branches in there. Uh, Pangea small ledge that holds the 0.25 ounce cups so I can keep a little dish of water and a little dish of fruit food for them. But over the years I found it more beneficial to do a little bit of live plants. You want to trim them a lot of course because they will want to grow towards the light and cover your uh, mist heads. I'll have pepperonia leaves go right in front of a mist nozzle so that the water will just drip straight down its stem. Um, Besides that, you just trim them, make sure they don't burn under the lights, and the geckos love them. It gets them a whole lot of uh, climbing room, and it makes them feel more naturally covered, um, while also uh, increasing positive air quality. Um, a lot of people kind of overlook that with planting cages, but your animals are breathing. That's the most important thing, uh, along with food and water. Why not give them some better air quality in their cage? So. Um, I've always been a huge advocate of live plants, um, and you don't need fancy lighting. A lot of people think that it means LED lights. You just pick low light plants, uh, air plants, shade, different shade plants like pothos, peperonia, wandering Jew, and you can just take trimmings, move them around your cages, and they will take off. And in the dim light, that's all they really need. I also dust all my feeders with either Rapashi Calcium Plus um, or I use Zoomed uh, Calcium with Vitamin D3. It's very important for bone growth and egg development to have a high calcium diet. Uh, the fruit-based diets like Pangea, uh, the Zoomed um, Gecko Food, those all have a balanced amount of calcium to them, so their insect load needs to be uh, augmented with calcium as well. Well, that about wraps it up for this week's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. Um, if you guys haven't subscribed yet, like and subscribe below. And uh, until next time. Thermo gradient out. Is that Lola snoring?